Okay, it's a little, it's a little muted, but um, I hear you, I hear you a little bit. Okay, awesome. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for joining us, and then um, I think I would leave you to it now. Thank you. Okay, sorry, I couldn't hear. I heard thank you, and that's about it. Oh, okay. So I said I will leave you to it now. I'll leave you to um, continue with the guest that the students are here in class. I don't know if you can see us waving. Can you see us waving? I see it. Okay, 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 yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, okay, so should I start? I should start, yeah? Yes. Okay. Okay. One moment. Let me just um, let me figure out how we can share this. Can you all see that? No. Yes. Yes. Okay. You still see it? You can still see that? Yes. Okay. I can't really hear you. So. so um, if you can speak up when I when I ask, then that'll be helpful because it's a little muted. But um, thank you all, honestly, for having me. Um, sorry, it's a little feedback. Thank you all for having me. It's a little early over here. I think it's about two a.m. my time. So, and I'm a little sick. So forgive my my voice. But I'm super excited to be here. Um, throughout the presentation, if you all have questions or anything like that, please feel free to stop me. And if I don't hear you, maybe like raise your hand or so, because I can see you more than I can hear you. Is that okay? Yes. Yes, okay. How many people are in the class right now? Like 10, 15? 15. 15. I didn't hear that number, but I'll go with 10. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll try to speak up loudly. Um, but yes, um, as you mentioned, my name is Miriam. Um, I'm a product designer at Netflix, um, and I'm also the founder of the Kamoyo Fellowship, which is uh, a design program um, that's meant to connect people who want to start designing to uh, Korea and, um, and the U.S. So today, I'm going to talk to you all about design thinking and more so using design thinking to center people in your product development process. Um, I understand you all are in the middle of, of your curriculum, if not towards the end of it. So um, some of this, if it seems redundant, just say, Miriam, speed up. We know this already, and I'll get to the other portions of it. Um, there's time at the end also for questions, but like I mentioned, if anything at any point doesn't make sense, feel free to just stop me and I'll, and I'll answer any questions. OK, so jumping into this. Um, Let's start with just the definition of design thinking. First off, show of hands, who's heard of design thinking? Like everyone should raise their hand, yeah. Who's heard of design thinking? No, okay. No one has heard of design thinking, is that, is that what I'm seeing? Thank you, somebody. Uh, show of hands, who's heard of design thinking? No. No, okay, yes, one person, okay, cool. So I, I, I won't rush through this definition then. So design thinking um, was a, a term is coined by um, Tim Brown, who is the CEO of IDEO. IDEO is um, probably one of the larger design firms, um, they say in the world, even though they, they don't really have any offices in Africa, but that's for another day. Um, but anyways, design thinking, he defined it as a human-centered approach to innovation that draws from a designer's toolkit to integrate the needs of the people the possibilities of technology and the requirements for business success. So that's kind of like how design thinking has been termed. I'm going to break this down into something that's a little bit more tactical because these are just words, right? So to break it down um, in another way, design thinking can really be thought of, um, well, one, I should say, when people hear design thinking, they mostly like it's a buzzword and they're usually thinking about like geniuses like this guy. Right, We're like, oh, Steve Jobs is one of the only few people that can design thinking. Or it's like, oh, you must be this mythical creature who understands design thinking. But really, I'm here to talk to you and tell you like, it's not that difficult. In fact, we probably do it 
on our own without even realizing that we're doing it. We do it by ourselves. It's just that we haven't really seen the process of it. So looking at design thinking and actually trying to um, equate it to a process, it's the design process, which may be familiar to some of you all. So to start off, right, we have research. That's the first step of the design process. Research is where we're trying to just understand the problem. What is it that we're, who is it that we're designing for? Um, what is the problem in itself? So on and so forth, right? The second part of the design process is to define. And that part is where you identify the problem and its use cases. So after conducting your research, you take your research, you analyze it, and then you say, okay, here's the exact problem we're trying to solve. Here's the use cases that we're trying to address. Tell me if I'm going too fast, okay? Um, the next portion is to ID. So ideation is all about now understanding the problems that you've, you've addressed and the problems, sorry, that you've um, identified. Now you start to brainstorm and create low fidelity solutions to try to figure out how to address those problems. Ideation usually goes hand in hand with prototyping. Prototyping is where you then take those low fidelity solutions that you came up with in the ideation phase and you kind of pick maybe a few of them that you want to then bring to high fidelity ideas. So low fidelity being wireframing, high fidelity to now being like your actual user mockups um, and so on and so forth. So prototyping, that's where you start to iterate on the more higher fidelity ideas. And then the last one that you have um, is actual testing. And that's where you actually put some of your prototypes and you put them in front of users to see how they respond. And those are the same users that you identified during your define and research stage. So at a whole, this is the design process. This is what design thinking looks like as a process. You may like, if you Google this and you see design thinking or design processes, some people may, you know, they may add an extra step or, or take away a certain step, but for the most part, it distills down to these kind of five phases. And they don't need to happen, um, like they don't happen always one after the other, usually they do, but oftentimes what you'll find in the design process is this is, this is more cyclical. So you may go from researching to define, ideate and prototype, you may bounce back and forth between those two phases, and you may even go back to research. So it's not that it must be done one after the other, but it's generally done within this order. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Yes, okay, cool. So going back to our definition then of design thinking, um, one of the things that I usually call out here is, when you see design thinking, the first the first uh, word outside of is, uh, of course, but the first actual word is human centered, and that's what I'm going to spend most of this uh, this uh, conversation speaking about is human centered and how to make your design process and your product development process be focused on users first and the end user first, right? So going back, when you look at that, that's the reason why when you see um, within the design process, research and define are the first two phases within the overarching design process. And those are literally the places where you are defining your user and trying to be human centered and, and um, user focused. So I'm gonna spend, like I said, majority of my time on these two phases to start so that we all can, can understand um, where, that, where that comes from. So diving in, most of the time, before I start any type of project, whether that's a freelance project, whether that's a project at Netflix or you know, a project with anything else, the first question I always ask is who are we designing for, right? Who are we designing for? It's the best question to start with. If you have no other question, just ask that one. Who are we designing for? Before you even ask, what is the problem? Start with that, right? Then of course you can follow up with, okay, what is the problem? But when I ask this question, normally the response that I get Sorry, one second. It's a little busy at night here. Um, but yes, the response that I normally get, um, it kind of falls into these things, right? Let's say people say we're designing for imaginary user A, right? And they'll say uh, imaginary user A has um, 20 years, 20, 35 years old. They live in the Eastern US. They make like, let's say 60 to 80K USD a year. And they're technologically advanced, right? And so then I tell people, like, okay, this is this is great, but 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 you just described pretty much every millennial in, in in like the U.S. So like, how is this actually helpful? What does this mean? To put it in a different way, if somebody said to me and they said, oh, someone said, hey, meet my friend. My friend is Marion. 
right? That's me, Miriam. And they said, oh, my friend Miriam, she's about like 20 or, or is it 25 or maybe she's 30. Um, I think she lives in like Boston or, or New York or, or you know, I don't, I don't know. I can't remember, somewhere in the Eastern US. She makes some type of money. I don't know how to make, know how much money I make. Um, and like, you know, sometimes she knows how to use computers. If somebody said that to me and they were tell, describing me as their friend, I'll tell them you're not my friend. You don't know anything about me. What you just described is, is nonsense, right? To that to some extent. So what I usually tell people is, if you can't describe your friend in these bullet points, then you shouldn't be describing your users in the same way. And to simplify that, it's basically saying that demographics are not your users. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Yes, okay. So demographics are not your users. Um, and to put it in another way, um, if you were to look at these things and you look at these bullet points, you wouldn't want to be distilled to these bullet points. You as a person would not want someone to come and try to describe you in this manner. So the question I normally ask people then is, how do we make these more human? How do you actually humanize the, um, these uh, or characterize these, these bullet points? And the answer is fairly simple. It doesn't need to be this difficult where right? we say, oh, like design thing is obviously, it's very simple. All we say is turn them into a human actually take these bullet points and start to characterize them and build a narrative behind them to make them feel personal and to make them feel real, right? So we're gonna walk through an example on taking these same things, right? And instead of using this, let's describe it a different way. So instead of saying my friend Miriam, let's use a user, her name is Maria, right? And we'll say, okay, Maria, she just turned 28. Um, give me one second. So Maria, she just turned 28 um, and she celebrated with friends and family back home in New York at one of her favorite Jamaican restaurants in a grill village. Um, so we also said that Maria, it's hard to find a good Jamaican, it's hard to find good Jamaican food, which is her favorite type of cuisine near her apartment in Boston. And her roommate Barack, that's no relation to Barack Obama, but we'll just say Barack, is sensitive to spicy food. So she can't order it very much. Right now, Maria can't wait until she gets permission so that she can get her own place and eat all the spicy food that she wants. Her annual $60,000 salary is just not doing it in Boston. She's, she's not making ends meet in Boston. So in the meantime, she's stuck with Barack and his taste buds who are pretty weak for the foreseeable future. Um, the last thing is, speaking of, uh, Barack, he just texted her to see if she's been able to connect to their Wi-Fi network. He's been having trouble connecting. And since she's the tech guru of the household, he wants to see if she could help troubleshoot. So taking what I just said, I just tried to, in this right-hand column, I just tried to humanize Maria and be able to now apply what you see in the left-hand column to the right. So instead of saying something like, Maria is 20 to 35 years old, what I did was I said, Maria just turned 28. I made it specific. Can you all see that in the first, in the first um, paragraph, right? You all can see that, okay. So I made it specific where it was like, Maria just turned 28. Um, she's celebrating with her friends, giving her some, some more life outside of the fact that she's 20 to 35 years old. Just that in itself will provide a little bit more context for who Maria is. Now go to the next one. Instead of saying that she lives in the Eastern US, the Eastern US is a very large um, coast. That can mean anything from Florida, to New York, to Boston, to Maine. Those are many different places. I've given her a specific place. I said that she lives in an apartment in Boston. So in, it, in itself, I could have just said, oh, she lives in Boston, that's a city. But I also gave you all a location and a setting, like she lives in an apartment, not a house. And she also has a roommate. I mentioned that she has a roommate. So this is now giving some life. Because if I just said she lives in Eastern US, you don't really know much about Maria outside of the fact that she can live anywhere along this, this coastline. But by telling you that she was in an apartment, that she has a roommate, you can start to kind of imagine what type of lifestyle Maria is living. Like the fact that she probably that she has a roommate probably tells you that you know she's not of the means to live by herself just yet. Um, the fact that she was in an apartment and not a home is the same type of mentality, right? Moving on, so we have someone um, the idea that she makes sixty thousand to eight eighty thousand USD a year, right? I let people know here that we say, okay, she has an annual salary of 60,000 USD. But I also let people know that that's just not doing it in Boston. Meaning like right now, $60,000, if I just told you that number and you had no context of what that means in the US, you would think 60,000 might be enough. 
but by the time they take out taxes, by the time they take out, you know, health insurance, all this other stuff, and then by the time you consider rent, somewhere in Boston, for example, 60000 is actually not enough for somebody to live off of. But again, if I didn't give you, provide this information on the right-hand side, and someone just saw on the left, you would think, you would have to make these assumptions on your own. You would maybe assume that, oh, 60000 seems like a lot of money, or you may assume that it doesn't seem like enough. So I provided some more context for what 60000 can get you in, in Boston for someone like Maria. Um, and then the last thing is the technologically advanced. So this can be a, a, a myriad of things, but again, here I put, okay, she's the tech guru of her household, meaning that she's the best person. If any, there's any tech questions, Barack doesn't understand what's happening, then the first person that he goes to is Maria. That gives you understanding of how technologically advanced she is. Because for some people, technologically advanced, like my parents think they're technologically advanced. I'm gonna tell you all this right now, they're not, right? But they think they are. Where some other people may be like, oh, you know, um, I'm, te I'm not as technologically advanced, but they actually may be very, very much like a tech guru of their household. Does that make so much, does that make sense? So bringing those, all four of those things together, you can see again, how we called them out in different ways throughout the story. And that is, is something that provides some more reality to these demographics. I'm gonna stop there real quick, just to see if there's uh, any questions. Any questions so far? No, no, no. Sorry, say that one more time. No, no, no. None at no. the moment. Okay, none at the moment. Okay. I need, you know, I like energy. So if you all, if you all, you know, I need a little bit more energy. We can, we can laugh here. It's all, it's all friends, okay? No problem. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So going on to the next, um, to the next portion. What I just described, that whole um, scenario that I just put down there's something that's called a user persona. Show of hands, who's heard of a user persona? Person, okay. So, sorry, how many, two people? No, 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 not two, but virtually everybody. Basically everyone. Okay, cool, so people have heard of user personas. All right, so we're not gonna spend too much time on that. But user personas are fictional, are fictional representation of the different types of people using your product. Right, and so what I did with Maria is I provided some form of a character and a caricature of who she is to kind of play that more user persona role. Usually this is something that's done by someone who has more user research experience or a user researcher, but oftentimes most design companies, most companies don't have dedicated user research um, resources or the people who are doing design are usually playing kind of like a, a temporary user research role. So I find it very helpful as a designer to kind of understand how to make the user persona, even if it's not completely perfect, right? Um, user personas in general are the core of a thorough user-centered design process. So again, clearly defining and providing a story of who your user is before you start to design is the number one key of the design process. And, and I don't need to preach that to you all because I'm pretty certain you all understand that by now. Um, so usually when I when I talk to people are like, okay, you talked a lot about these user personas, but you haven't even showed any design. So let's actually get into how this is related to, to designs and, and how this how you can take information from persona to convert them into your, your ultimate output. So I'm gonna start with Google. Um, so fun fact, before, I decided to work for Netflix. My dream was to work for Google. Um, and part of the, I applied for Google and part of the application process, you have to do a design interview. And they also give you a design take home assignment exercise. And that's where they kind of determine based on what you provide them, how much of a designer you are, how skilled you are, and whether or not they should invite you to the final on site interview, right? So for Google, um, they gave me this design this design um, challenge. Hold on one second. Okay. So they gave me this design challenge. And the design challenge was as follows. It was saying to design an experience that will help connect people looking for a new pet with the right companion for them. Help an adopter find a pet which matches their lifestyle, considering factors including breed, gender, age, temperament, and health status. So basically saying, hey, me to create something that helps people adopt a pet, whether that's a cat, a dog, a donkey, whatever it is, just help them up, uh, help a user adopt a pet. 
they intentionally make these um, design challenges and these design experiences vague so that people can kind of answer them however they feel. It's more so really what they're trying to test is what is your design process? So that whole process that I showed you all before, Google is using the same thing to try to understand and evaluate how to hire designers, right? So for my, um, for my challenge, I started off in the same way that I told you all. So before I even looked at anything, I've never adopted a pet before. I'm Nigerian, we don't really do that. So it's just like, there's a pet, as you all know, you just get the pet, the pet is there. But you know, this is America, so people are like, oh, we need to adopt the pet, you know, the, the official way. So I had to first understand the process and I had to research the process. What is it like to actually design? Um, what is it like, sorry, to actually go about and adopt a, a pet? What does that look like? So the first thing I did, um, like any other person, I think, if you have a problem, even though I was applying for Google, um, I, I started with Google because that's where most people usually start, assuming that it's the initial step that most users would take. So I started to Google, okay, how to adopt a pet. Um, I live in San Francisco, so I looked at how to adopt a pet in San Francisco. Um, I wanted to put myself in the user's shoes and try to understand, again, the problem and research that. So after Googling that, I looked at some things. I figured, you know what, maybe it's best to actually speak to someone who has a little bit more expertise in this. So I actually messaged a friend of mine. Her name is Leslie. This is actually Leslie, a real picture of her. She's a former coworker, but she also uh, volunteered at animal shelters for about three years. Um, at the time, it was three years. So I gave her a call and I spoke to her and I said, hey, can you actually talk to me about what is it like to one, volunteer at a shelter, but also like, what is the process of adoption like? What do you normally see? So some of the things that, this is, we had a probably like an hour long or two hour long conversation over the phone. But these are kind of some of the things that I distilled from that conversation. Again, I'm still in the research phase. So some of the preliminary information that I got from Leslie was that, you know, she said in terms of the overall process of adopting a pet, you have to pay some fees to cover the different vaccination. So there's a cost that's associated with it. You have to provide specific documents. So they may ask you to provide um, your birth certificate or a background check to make sure that they're not providing um, putting a pet in a dangerous um, environment, some so things like that. And then lastly, you know, she mentioned that there's three different types of shelters that you can adopt adopt for from. So some shelters may be shelters where they only feature rescue animals, or some shelters may be places where you can only get animals of a certain type. So there's three there's different types of shelters, and that's helpful for people to understand. So after understanding this and getting some information from her, I figured, you know what? Let's take this research a step further. Let's actually go into the field. And notice right now, obviously, I, I'm, not, I'm not a user researcher per se, but I still understand the, the fundamentals on how to go about conducting some form of research to at least guide my designs in the case where I won't have a user researcher to work with. Um, so in this scenario, I decided, okay, taking the conversation that I had with Leslie, <clears throat> excuse me, taking the conversation that I had with Leslie, but then also, um, taking the taking what I what I looked at when I Google, I decided to actually go into the field and go to a um, an animal shelter and just conduct user interviews there and research and 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 observe people in the natural process of adopting a pet. So I went to um, the San Francisco uh, animal shelter. It's actually the oldest and largest animal shelter in this area. So that was super helpful. I think it was well, it was founded in 1868. So they've been doing this for a while. I went there and I decided to just observe people. And if some people were willing to talk, which two people were, I was able to actually conduct um, some user interviews. So the first person that I met when I was there, he was another employee of the shelter, right? And again, I'm still calling out, I'm still in research phase. So he was an employee of the shelter. He was at the front desk, his name is Bruce. He's been there, he was there for eight years. So I was just talking to him, it was probably close to 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and I asked him, you know, can he talk to me through his process, talk to me about his time at the center, keep me a pretty open end. And then eventually I ended up asking him, what is it like when people need to come and adopt? Like, what would, what, what would you say, say about people that generally come to this, to this shelter? And what he, what he said was, was a, a combination of these things. One, he said, most people that are coming to the shelter, when they come for an animal, they're looking mostly for companionship. So they're looking for someone or something to actually provide some form of friendship and companionship for them. He also said that people that come in have usually been considering owning a pet for a while, but they had different factors that constrained them from actually going forward with it. So some people, you know, their apartment may not allow them to 
or their old apartment may not have allowed them to actually own an animal, but they recently moved, so now they can, right? Um, the other thing he mentioned is that the most important thing is people, is chemistry, is the chemistry that a person has with the, with the animal and vice versa, not their physical attributes. So this is a key role, I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in, later on in, in the presentation. But a lot of times people will come in and they may have this idea of they want a dog that's a golden retriever, that's you know, X amount of, that's a puppy, so on and so forth. But they end up may leaving with something else. They may leave with the cat even, because the thing that matters the most to them is the chemistry, is how the animal relates to them. The other thing is energy of um, the animals. So specifically, if you have younger children, most of the time, the, the um, adoption agencies, they will recommend that you get younger cats not kittens, because kittens may be too energetic for somebody who's a child, right? So taking in, into account the energy level of the of both the people who are who are planning on adopting the pet and the pet itself are important. And that also ties into the chemistry as an overall thing. Um, and he did provide some feedback generally saying like, hey, shelters could do a better job of screening and educating adopters. So he felt that there was some room for improvement from shelters where they make sure they're actually giving animals to people who are going to take care of them and put them in a safe space, but also educate adopters on what it's like to, to um, um, actually own a pet. So that was the first interview that, that was conducted. Any questions here? Okay. So the, next, the next interview was with someone named Margaret. So at this point, I had actually only conducted research with people who either worked for a shelter or were on the more shelter side. I hadn't actually um, conducted any studies with anyone who had actually now gone and adopted a pet. So Marcus, I ran into him also at the shelter and he was in the process of adopting a pet. It was actually a really sad story, um, but it's a, it's a happy ending. Um, this guy, Marcus, he's owned pets for, throughout his life since childhood, he's always adopted pets. So I called him the expert because he's, he's been adopting pets since he was a baby. Um, and that day that we saw that I saw him, his cat had passed away that day. Um, and he was already back in the shelter to try to find a new pet so he could avoid feeling lonely. So automatically, the first thing that when I had the conversation, with him, he had said that. And if you remember, the thing that people kept talking about before him in my research was people come in looking for companionship. And Marcus automatically spoke to that, where he said, I feel lonely, I'm looking for companionship with another pet, given that my one, my recent cat passed away. He also mentioned that he preferred dogs, um, but that he wasn't tied to having a dog. So again, chemistry more so than um, uh, preference. Um, he mentioned that he lives in a condo and that his apartment had some constraints. So he had to make sure he had a pet that was less than 20 pounds. These are some of the constraints that he was thinking of as he was going through. Um, and it was cool seeing him actually walk through the shelter because he would actually just get excited when he saw an animal that he liked and he would go in and try to like find more information about them to often like try to connect with them and understand would they be connecting with him. And one of the last things that I'll call out here is that he performed something that he personally called the jump test to see if there was chemistry between him and either a cat or a dog. So he would go into the shelter, go into um, a space, and try to see, oh, does the pet go into the pet space? And if the pet would jump on him, whether it's a dog or a cat, then he would know, okay, the, the pet likes him. If the dog or cat never walked towards him, he'd be like, no, 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 we gotta leave this guy alone. They don't like, he doesn't like me, so we're gonna keep it, keep it separate. So those are some of the things that Marcus was speaking about. Um, lastly, I left the shelter. I was there for about probably like, I think I was there for about six to eight hours that day. Um, but leaving the shelter, I wanted to get another perspective of someone who had just actually adopted a pet. So up until this point, I'd gotten people who worked on the adoption side. I got someone who was in the middle of deciding whether or not to adopt. And now I wanted someone at the end who actually had gone through the whole process. So that's when I got in contact with another friend of mine and his fiance, who was Kevin Alley, and they adopted this dog, Boba is the name of the dog. Um, and prior to that, they had never owned an animal. Um, prior to adopting this dog. So it was actually great where they were telling me about what their process was like as the first time, first time adopters. And it was a similar thing when I started asking them, I said, why is it that you decided to adopt? The first thing that they said is Allie, who is um, my friend's fiance, she was lonely at home because he used to frequently travel for work. Again, you hear this whole thing of companionship, looking for companionship. 
they mentioned that they've gone in looking for a specific breed. The breed type was Pomsky. I don't know what type of dog that is, but that was the breed that they were looking for. Um, and they had a budget at $1,200, but that it was usually outside of their budget. So a coworker suggested that they go to a nearby um, adopting agency as a cheaper alternative. And while Ali had this idea of what type of dog they wanted and what what dog what the dog should look like from the shelters like Facebook page, she saw Boba, who was not at all like the dog that they were actually looking for. It's not the same breed; it's a different breed. They don't even know what type of breed that it is. Um, but the, she said the chemistry was instant, so that trumped everything else. Um, so she completed the process during her lunch break. It was super quick. She made the decision very quickly, um, and eventually. Um, they went to the shelter with proof from their landlord and consent from their landlord that they could finalize the adoption. So that was the entire process and they had gone through step by step kind of how they went through it and why they decided to go with, with Boba versus another dog. So after conducting all of these things and conducting all this research, um, I started to then leave that research, field, right? And I started to then push into the design phase. So taking everything that I learned, why? conducting that and I wanted to now go ahead and distill it. There's different ways that people go about it. There's different ways that people go about actually taking this information to now synthesize it. The way that I go I went about it, forgive me, it may be a little blurry. Can you all see that though? Yeah. Yes. Yes, okay. So it's a little blurry, but but the, the basics of it is this. One of the key things to think about when conducting research is never start to start trying to find patterns while you're conducting research. As a researcher and as a designer who is researching, your main job is to listen and to get notes, take notes. That's it. When you're in the research phase, just listen and take notes. Don't start to make assumptions. Don't start to try to solve so Don't start to provide solutions. You are only there to observe. What that does for you, and it's, it's a hard skill. You have to kind of unlearn and, un and, and prevent yourself from starting to jump to start finding solutions because that's naturally what we want to do as designers. But by forcing yourself to only observe and to listen and to watch, what that does is you start to notice things that you probably wouldn't have noticed before, right? Now, taking all these research that I conducted, I would record all of the conversations that I was having with people. I would record them and I would take notes at the same time. Then when I was in the define phase, which is this phase that you're starting to see, all I started to do was just write down the different notes that I was getting from people. So if I heard any type of response uh, while I was reviewing my, my interview with Marcus, for example, or my interview with Leslie, for example, I would start just writing down all the different notes on post-it notes, right? And so some people have different ways to try to make this work. You can, I prefer post-it notes because it forces you to be concise with each, with each thought. So each of these yellow post-it notes that you see, they're individual, um, pieces of information that I received from all the different research that I had done. So across uh, both Marcus, Bruce, Leslie, all of those information, I just started writing them as post-it notes and I just put them up to my wall. This is actually, this was my apartment. So it's super rough. It wasn't even like an office. This was my apartment, uh, my bedroom in my apartment. Um, so yes, after taking all of that, the next thing that I did is something called pattern matching. Um, have any of you all heard of pattern, ma pattern matching? Okay, so, so pattern matching is basically you take all this information, all of these different post it notes, and you start to cluster them into things that are similar, aka patterns, right? So you may say, okay, some of the patterns that I'm starting to see, I started hearing similar quotes of like, I felt lonely, or um, I was looking for someone to, to be, a, I was looking for something to be a companion, or um, you may say, oh, this person, this, this dog was just it just spoke to me more so than, a, than another dog. I was seeing those types of things. But pattern matching basically says, take these different information and start to group them to things that are very similar. And what you'll see is those pink post-it notes are basically the different patterns that I started to see. So if you see one of them is like physical preferences, um, which is in the top left. Another one you may see is like animal personality. Another one you may see is companionship that's in the middle. I started to now just um, provide some form of a summary word to define what this cluster of information was starting to, to um, see. So define the pattern. Does that make sense so far? Yes. Yes, okay. So, sorry, someone said something. Yes. Yeah. 
I'm so I'm so sorry. It's very it's very muffled. What you're saying? Um, mm -hmm. Can you try repeating it? Maybe is there a microphone there that you can get closer to? But it's it's very muffled. Say that one more time. He had a baby people who had two access before, like uh, the first guy with that saw and low face, the second guy uh like this, uh, yeah, especially in face so and the third guy who had sex. What about the person of the people who had never had sex before? Like the the low face yes, but the best thing to stop at the time. How about that? Yeah. I'm sorry. Um maybe there's I'm sure to see if, uh, there's another way to get to it, because I'm still not hearing you. Um, actually, maybe, oh, do you want to maybe call me on WhatsApp because I can't hear, I can't hear the question. Or can you type it? Okay, yeah, I think that's right. You probably just type it and then you send to you. So, um, probably just go. You can type it now. It's, it's okay, I'll wait. You're typing it now. Okay. Whoever was saying that you should ask her a question, wherever you're standing or sitting, I could hear that person clearly. So maybe the person that asked the question can be in the same position. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Can you have a Yes. We had someone who worked in the store, in a, an additional level of faith and Another level of faith. But basically, I am not talking about people who are never on faith, talking to the store to get faith for the first time. How is that? Yeah. I, let, let me see. I heard like bits and pieces. Is it that the question is for the user persona, um, yeah. when I'm meeting and talking to people for the first time, what was that experience like? Okay. Okay, yeah. let me let me see if I can help with that question. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Miriam. Thanks for the time. It's been insightful so far. So I think the question, if I got it right, was that um, this person now where, where people who actually love and had experiences with pet, but did you uh, interview someone who had zero experience with pet? What was that like? Or what would that look like? Oh, okay. I see. Um, thank you. So, um, if I was to interview, well, to be very honest, sorry, one second. To be honest, um, I wouldn't interview someone who has no experience with pets. Um, so, oh, I see what you're saying. You're talking about um, my friend Kevin and, and Ali, who didn't have experience with pets, yeah? Okay, so um, with those people, I, would, I was interviewing them really because they were going to give me the most like I would say curious experience with how it is to go through the process um, with no prior knowledge because most of the people that I was dealing with and I really wanted to find someone who had this if you notice most of the people I was dealing with they had been either working with an adoption center for about three years to eight years so they had a lot of experience with pets or you had someone like Marcus who had um, experience um, adopting pets for most of his childhood. So I had a lot of experts, right? And that's great, but those are almost like power users, right? I wanted to balance the power users with someone who um, didn't have as much experience to make sure that what the power users were experiencing wasn't something that was only um, relevant to their user type. So to just kind of make sure that, hey, this is something that people, even with zero experience, they, they feel similar things. So the idea was to try to get people at a broad 
um, spectrum along like the adoption process to make sure that the user persona that I ultimately end up going with is robust and reflective enough of everyone that's going through the process. Does that answer the question? Okay, sorry about the, the confusion. Okay, so moving forward then, um, I can show you, so these pink post-it notes that I was mentioning, these are all the different patterns that I started to call out amongst um, all of the notes that I was taking. And just to put it so you all can see it clearly, it was looking like this. Hold on. Okay. So basically you had research. So see, these are the research trends that I was getting. These are the patterns that I was seeing. You had companionship, which I mentioned a couple of times throughout this. Um, the second being, I'm not going to call out all of them, but just some of the ones that that are more um, prevalent. Chemistry over preference was another one. So coming in saying you want some type of dog, but really ended up with a cat because you like them more. Um, the animal personality, if the person was, if the animal was energetic, doesn't match the energy of the level of, of the owner. The price, shelter types, those types of things. These are, these are the patterns that I came up with. And from these patterns, I ended up going forward and I decided to then say, okay, Looking at these patterns, looking at the responses that I was getting, let's create this ultimate persona. So the persona that I, that I ended up coming with, up with was someone named Jordan, right? So I named this person Jordan, um, and this picture is actually one of my former um, coworkers, but for the sake of it, we just call her Jordan. To be honest with you, most of the time when I create a persona, I don't like to use an image because people will try to apply gender norms um, and racial norms, whatever norms based off of the image. So they may have the image sometime overpower what you're showing. So sometimes I'll try to keep the image abstract. So maybe it's a caricature or maybe it's, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? It may be like a diagram, a picture, or honestly it may not have any picture associated with it. Just that people don't start applying um, their own thoughts and perceived notions onto the picture. And then also when naming the persona, I tried to use names that are also not gender exclusive, unless the persona is usually people that we're dealing with mostly women or mostly men. But for the most part, I try to keep it where um, it's, it's um, gender non-binary. So we have someone like Jordan, that name can be used for both women and men. So again, to try to separate um, the gendered standards with there. And so taking Jordan, what I said is, okay, Jordan, meet Jordan. Jordan is, this is her first time living alone and is looking for a companionship. They've always wanted, but they've never owned a pet before. So this is coming back from a hey, people who are newer, but they've always wanted a pet, but for some reason they couldn't. Um, they've always been around pets. Their close relatives have pets. Um, Jordan just moved into an apartment that has a few pet restrictions. So calling out the fact that what we saw a lot of times is people had to make sure that their place, um, the restrictions of their place, they were making sure they were getting pets that aligned with those restrictions or, or were within the boundaries of what they could own based on where they live. Um, I also call out the fact that the apartment is located next to a dog park. So you can see that the, the apartment is a place where dogs can actually play and live and it's a sustainable area. And then last thing I mentioned here was that Jordan has a soft spot for golden retriever puppies. So they, they have a preference for a type of, of dog. Um, and that's also calling out the thing that I normally saw, saw while I was conducting research, which is again, people having these preferences, but that not meaning much. So taking all of that, right, um, and looking at, um, what all of those things mean, I decided to then focus on a certain portion of, this is for the design challenge. Um, I decided to focus on a certain portion within the adoption process. And that portion was more so the pre-shelter visit. And honestly, you could focus on any different portion. Uh, you could have focused on when they actually get to the shelter, how do they decide what animals to visit? You could also focus on the post-shelter visit, like how do you check in and make sure things are okay? But for the design challenge, I felt that the part that I could probably have the most solutions for was specifically for that pre-shelter visit. Um, and I decided to also make it focus and constrain myself to just the mobile um, mobile devices. So the thinking being that a lot of people um, that I was talking to when they decided that they wanted an animal before even visiting a shelter, like I mentioned, the first thing that they would normally do is start to Google or go on Facebook um, or talk to some friends all through their phone to figure out what it is that they need to do to get us um, to get a uh, a pet. And also, the thing that was more important that I called out here 
from my challenge is that the most formal adoption decisions, they were made very spontaneously. So a lot of those decisions were happening on the phone very quickly, right? So I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit to now, and a lot of this, I'm not gonna spend too much time, just more so to illustrate how this, how this persona and all of this research, how I pulled that all into the final designs. So in this design process, I went about now ideating and prototyping um, uh, a final kind of um, display. And that ended up looking like this. So going back to the user persona, remember some of the things to call out here. Companionship is one of the bigger ones. Um, never owning a pet, so they're, they're a bit nascent and ignorant to the process. So re remembering that. Remembering the re restrictions of them moving into an apartment, and then also remembering the preference for golden retrievers. So using all that information, this is kind of the result of um, what we took. And because this was, this was a Google design challenge, I used their um, design language, so the Google material design language and the visual system, I use that here um, in, the, in the presentation. So this is just a snapshot of some of the designs, but to break it down to you, what we say is like, imagine someone was on Google and they looked up, oh, I wanna adopt a pet, and maybe they found this one pet named Milo, right? Or Milo, right? So we would, we'll have it, so um, for the results, the first thing that I did is calling out this whole chemistry over preference. I made sure that the image of the pet. So you all see that picture of, of, of the dog. I made it the smallest, some of the smaller um, portions of this design. So I intentionally kept it small so that users would not be biased by their physical preference, right? Because if someone sees an image, they're like, oh my gosh, like I love this dog, but they didn't take the time to actually understand the, the, what type of dog it is. So I spent more time um, and I made sure that, that the element, the first card, the elements of the first card were really more so talking to the characteristics and um, the personality of the pet. So you see the first thing you see is that 78% compatibility, that scores, is, is, it's made up, but you know you could say based on what you said, this is, this is the compatibility score of this dog. Again, chemistry over preference, trying to get at that there. Having the name be the thing that you see more so first before the picture. And then also having some form of a description on like what type of dog it is. So we say that it's shy um, and so on and so forth, right? The next thing um, that we have here is um, the health and education. So this was more so geared towards people understanding what it is that you would need to be able to adopt this dog. I'm sorry, what is it that you would need to understand like, hey, this dog doesn't have these vaccinations. So from a pricing perspective, here's how much this will cost you to actually, when you take on this dog, what's, what they'll need. So if I put here the vaccinations, I put the status, the status is incomplete. So again, educating users, whether they're more advanced or they're people who are newer of like what the status and the, the overall health of the, of the dog is. Um, and hitting learn more will take them to a further education center so they can understand like, what does it mean if the person is, if this dog isn't protected against worms or Bordetella, what do all these things mean? There's more information if you hit learn more. Um, and then the other portion was, this is more so dedicated to people who are specifically new. Um, but I call this the adoptive preparedness section. And so understanding what you need before you even get to the, the animal shelter. So before you get there, make sure you have a photo ID, proof of your current address, proof from your landlord if you have one. And then there's some other things like, if you already have an animal, bring that animal as well. This adoption center will need to, some adoption centers require that other animals within the household be brought to meet the other, the, uh, potential animal they want to adopt to make sure that those animals are also compatible. So those types of things were also brought in. Um, and then lastly, I ended with this section to one, obviously, just provide the formal shelter information and show them like, you know, when it's open, when it, when it closes, so on and so forth. Um, and this is, this is presumably the last step that you would see after deciding, oh, I want to actually go ahead and formalize this process, process of adopting this dog. So I would need to come to this, to this center. So that was like a high waving thing, but you can see throughout every single step that I just showed you all, every single visual that you saw, it was all tied back to those things that you saw with, um, um, with Jordan, the persona. Okay, does that make sense so far? Okay. Um, and like, obviously if this was a real thing, I would have then gone out and conducted tests, iterated, go back, go to ideating, go to prototyping and kind of continue the cycle. So we actually launched it, but it wasn't, um, it was just for a design 
challenge. Um, and so I didn't actually go out and, and proceed with the test. But I will say, um, based on the response that I got, so I ultimately did end up getting the job from Google. And their, ba their, their main feedback on why was because they said the way that I spent time doing research and the way that I spent actually defining the problem and stating out the use cases that's the reason why they gave me the position. So again, even though you know it wasn't a live project product, the reason why they, they evaluated my designs was really more so on how I spent time researching and defining the problem. So just to verify that, that's um, just to validate this process. That's kind of just an example there. Um, I'm gonna stop there to make sure there's no other questions before I go forward. Okay. Um, so. Obviously, I don't work for Google, I do work for Netflix. So I'm gonna end on this, and I know that we're running a little low on time, so I may speed through this a little quickly. Um, so um, with Netflix, this project um, was a project that I was working on sometime earlier this year. Um, and unfortunately, I can't go into the details of it fully in terms of what we made, but I can show you how you will also use user personas and how I've used user personas to help generate ideas. Because that's also something that's very valuable and powerful in this. So for Netflix, um, obviously, you know, our main our main problem from the member side is always trying to the most common thing we were trying to figure out is how do we help members find more content that's suitable for them at any point within their viewing journey on the service. So basically, if you're watching, let's say, Narcos or um, Narcos Mexico, how do we let you know that there's other, there's other forms of Narcos on the service? Or if you're watching, um, let's say, what's another one? Let's see what another show is. Uh, when they see us um, and you want to go to Bandersnatch or you're going to watch Black Mirror and you want to go to Bandersnatch, how do we let people understand that there's more suitable content for them to watch? That's kind of what our main problem is when we look at Netflix. Um, I'll just give you all some numbers. The numbers are actually even, I think they're even larger now. But at the time, uh, we had 150 million subscribers, just so you understand what our user base is. 150 million subscribers across 190 countries, right? So if you were to put that in another way, the people that we're designing for, we're asked the who, who are we designing for? What they'll say is we're designed for adults, we're designed for single parents, we're designed for kids, we're designed for teens, grandparents, your annoying uncle, aliens, we're literally designing for everybody, right? And so like, it's like, it's hard to answer that question of who. And I'll be honest, when I joined Netflix, I struggled with this initially in terms of like, if I'm designing for everyone, how do I decide who to actually design for? Because we design for everyone, then what's the point of even doing a user persona, right? Um, and so the way I also put it for people is like, if you want to look at it a different way, we're designing for someone like Barack, and someone who's on the opposite end, like this crazy guy, right? And that's craziness. How do I design for both of these people? They're like extremely different. We can understand that, right? Or you may say we're Nigerian friends for like General Buhari, or we're designing for President Buhari. Two different people, or maybe they're the same, who knows? But like still, these people are on opposing ends um, of, the, of the design, right? And if we go back to our demographic way, of looking at it, imagine if I applied the same demographics that you saw at the beginning of this presentation to, to try to distill who the Netflix is, uh, who the Netflix user base is. It could look something as crazy as this: like we're designed for people that are from one to 103 years old. You know, they live everywhere, right? They make any amount of money, and their tech proficiency is from very limited to pretty much expert. Right? These are like very wide ranges. You know what I mean? So like. How in the hell do I design for this? That was a question, you know, that I have, and I still kind of have sometimes when I'm designing for things at Netflix. And so what I can show you all is that you can still apply this to something that's extremely wide ranging and widespread. So to that question I was asked earlier, it's like, how did you, why did you talk to somebody who had limited experience with um, owning a pet uh, versus speaking to just experts? This is just to show you that you can have things that go run the gamut um, and the idea is to try to just get a snapshot of it. So if we take this, right, and we try to think back to this and say, okay, what is our task, right? And the task is still, we're helping members find content that's most suitable for them at any point within their viewing journey on the service. That was the task that I, that I was given, right? And so what I did is that I said, okay, this persona, you don't need to just have one persona to represent your users. Because obviously if it's a wide range, it'll hard, it's hard to just get one one um, caricature to represent this base. So I actually created three different personas for this task, 
right? The first one was someone named Sunny, and I'll get into these deeper. But imagine Sunny as like the super fan of content on Netflix, right? Like they're always they're always watching something, um, and they're super fans of like uh, all of our favorite shows. And they are just in terms of their viewing journey, they had just finished wrapping up um, a show, right? So Sunny is like, oh my gosh, I need more content. Sunny's always looking for new things, right? Then you have somebody else like Woods. Woods is, you know, they're new to the service, they're new to the content, but they are starting to enjoy, you know, they just got into like maybe three or four episodes of Orange is the New Black, so they're starting to enjoy a piece of content. Woods is like someone that they just got here, right? And then the last persona was someone like Nikki, right? Nikki is, Nikki isn't the best person for us. Nikki is like, they're new to the content, but Nikki is starting to lose interest in it. So Nikki has started watching, I don't know, Daredevil or um, what's another good show whatever show was on Netflix, um she started watching it but uh, she's already like losing interest she's not really feeling it, right so those are the three personas that i tasked with people for this brainstorm to start, start to think of and then by taking them to be a little deeper right um i gave them now going through this characteristic so sunny is more than just like a super fan let's actually describe what type of super fan sunny is so funny story this is real like i actually showed this to people during um my our brainstorm and they didn't know that i think sunny i'm a big king sunny Ade fan so sunny was actually sunny Ade, but nobody knew that except for me but it's okay so i said okay sunny Nigerian, right and sunny is a huge fan of a queer eye Right. And basically I was saying Sunny has posters of the, of the Fab Five all over there. And when they come back from school and in between shows, they'll turn on Netflix to watch some of their favorite queer eye episodes. So automatically I let people understand Sunny is a student, right? Sunny usually I give people some type of understanding of when does Sunny usually watch Netflix when they come back from, from school and they're looking for things to watch in between shows. Um, then I also set the scenario of like, hey. Right now, in this particular moment, Sunny's in the middle of rewatching the most recent season um, when a Christmas special, so I'm trying to set the scene, a Christmas special episode launches on the service. So this is actually an episode, it's fake, but it's an episode, let's say, that is featuring members of the, of the Queer Eye cast. Um, and they're remaking uh, Chris Kringle. I'm not sure if people are fans of Queer Eye, but it's basically a fashion show that people um, try to give makeovers to. So they're, make -over, they're doing makeovers on Santa Claus. This is all fake, like I said. But he's in the middle of rewatching the season and that episode drops. And he's a Queer Eye fan, right? Um, and so we also say that there are two exclusive bonus episodes that he hasn't seen um, yet. And we just got an official launch date for the next season. These are all things that happen. The question that I then pose in the brainstorm for people is, how would you let Sunny know about this new episode that was launched on the service? How would you let Sunny know about the extra exclusive bonus episodes that have also launched in the service, right? That was a question in the brainstorm. The other things that I mentioned on the, on the left-hand side that you see are just things that aren't necessarily related to the task per se, but there are other details about Sunny as a person. So we know that Sunny usually watches more television series than films. And that usually though, they don't complete more than two episodes in one sitting. So you start to understand the behavior Right. And we also know, okay, Sunny's in a romantic comedy mood right now. They're looking for more romantic comedy. Um, um, but then like, you know, um, some of their last episodes that they watched were to all the boys I've loved before, four episodes of Easy, so on and so forth. It's again trying to humanize who this Sunny person is outside of just being a super fan. What does it actually mean as a user? So that was Sunny. I'm gonna run through these other ones very quickly because I know we're almost at time. Um, with Woods, like I mentioned. Woods was a person that um, is new to the service, new to the content, but they're starting to enjoy the content. So the same question that we asked is, how would you help Woods understand what to watch next, right? And so with Woods, Woods loves to cook, and not great at cooking, um, tries to watch as many cooking shows as he can whenever they get the chance, and usually watches it after coming back from work, right? And while prepping dinner. So this is different than Sunny. Woods doesn't watch something call this background watching at Netflix. Woods, Woods watches things in the background. So while he's prepping dinner, he'll be watching Netflix. So he's not necessarily fully engaged, but he's somewhat engaged. Whereas with Sonny, Sonny is more dedicated to watching. Sonny was someone who came home and he sat down and he would watch the episode and only the episode, right? Um, so that's something, another nuance to call out. Uh, when Woods is going through, Woods sees an episode uh, for Chef's Table 
France that catches his attention. He's about to visit France for the first time. So explaining why that actually catches his attention. Um, and he starts to watch it. After some time, Woods has actually stopped prepping the meal and Woods is, is, is completely dedicated to the TV. So that's a dead, to show you all that, oh, Woods has become a fan of this title. He started, she started off by not really liking um, or not really being fully engaged to ultimately not even prepping her meal and fully watching the show, right? So that's, that's another question. Um, and the last one is Nikki. Um, and Nikki, as I mentioned, Nikki is a person who is started watching something, but she's just not interest is not really doing it for her. So the question here is, okay, the other two persona were all people who were either fans of the content or becoming fans of the content. Whereas this persona is like someone who's actually losing interest. How do you how do you get them to watch something else? Right? What is it that we do for them to make them watch something else after they've just expressed that they're losing interest and may potentially leave the service? Is there stuff that we can do? So you know, Nikki, Nikki loves Black Panther. It's her favorite. It's her favorite movie. Um, she finally has a free Saturday, and a bunch of her friends have been telling her she should watch Luke Cage. So she gives it a try. After two and a half episodes, she's not really feeling it. She's been pausing the show, restarting it. She's been getting texts from friends. She's she's not really. She's more distracted by the phone not notifications than watching the show. So she tries to come back one more time and give the series a, another shot. And four minutes in, she's reaching for the remote. So that's where we leave it. Right? And so the brainstorm there was again, at this moment, when, she, when Nikki is reaching for the remote, what can we do to make sure that Nikki doesn't now end the show or watches something else, right? So taking all of that into consideration, why I say that this is helpful for brainstorms. So in this brainstorm session we are doing with these three different personas, um, we had people, we had product designers that were involved, we had UX writers that were involved, we had film and series producers. We did this actually in Los Angeles with our film team and our series team. We had video editors, we had sound designers, we had user researchers, product managers, both technical and non-technical. So there was a range of people who were here. What's helpful about the persona is it brought this problem that felt very abstract and honestly probably felt more designer. -y. It brought this problem and it made it something that anyone, even you all, well, our Netflix employees, if I gave you those personas and asked you this problem, you'll be able to now actually put yourself in that position to try to come up with a solution. So it humanized the problem and made it less technical and made it less abstract and allowed people to now have conversations about this in a way that created ideas from anyone. So instead of just only doing this with product designers or people at Netflix, I can actually run this same, same brainstorm with people like you all and be able to get other ideas from people who normally wouldn't be in those conversations. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I'm gonna end there just real quick to kind of take some, some um, uh, uh, last minute thoughts here, just to kind of summarize everything that we had. So as I said, unfortunately, I can't show you all that stuff, but we are in the process of developing it. Um, the, the results from that brainstorm, we're in the process of designing it. So fingers crossed, you know, it'll launch on Netflix within the next year. Um, but as a whole, to summarize everything that we've kind of spoken about here today, um, the biggest thing in terms of like design thinking and, and being user-centered is like we said, to start with the user and to make them personable. So that's the biggest thing, make this person a person, abstracted away from the demographics. So pull out the stories, characteristics, and personalities from your target demographics. As you see, I've done this in examples with people that are actual end users, so like Netflix users, I've actually done it with that and taken demographics from Netflix users to make them personable. But I've also done it with things like with the Google assignment where my target demographic, I had to define that myself. You don't need to have as clear um, demographics as always. You can go out and make these your own and take liberties with it. So you can go ahead and say like, yes, I'm designing for someone like Jordan, or I'm designing for someone like Nikki, or designing for someone like Woods. It doesn't need to be perfect. It needs to be personable. That's what matters more so than anything else. So pulling out the stories and the characteristics from your target demographics is number one. The other thing is, like I said, in the same vein, it's to turn numbers and figures, those numbers from the demographics into personas and user scenarios. So with the Nikki's and, and the Woods and, and, the, and the Jordans, I made sure to try to place them in a scenario. So like saying, oh, Nikki's about to reach for the remote. 
and turn the channel and, and turn off Netflix. That's a scenario that I put Nikki in. So now you as a designer can now take that on and be like, oh, how do we prevent her from turning the channel, so on and so forth, right? Um, the last thing is, and that, like I mentioned earlier in this slide, is you keep the core facts in place. I'm not saying to now, if, if the demographics say that your end user is between the ages of 20 to 35, don't now go make a persona that's 65. That doesn't make sense, right? Like keep the core facts in place, but still don't be afraid to take liberties with the extra details of your persona. So they can be 28, but they can have just turned 28, you know? So, so feel, make, it, make it as a story that you wanna read um, in the end. Um, like I mentioned, there's no wrong or right way to do this. This is really more so for you to ground these end users into something that's a person, that's a friend. It should almost feel like your friend by the time you finish writing it. The whole idea is like you be creative and you have fun with it, but ultimately like imagine that these are your friends that, that you're dealing with. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's pretty much everything um, there. I'm gonna come back here to see uh, if there are other questions. Sorry, I know I'm a little over time. Sorry, I'm trying to expand this out. Okay. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. I have a question. Um, so have you ever had to design something and maybe you've not gone so in depth into your research? Maybe you want to design um like for example the um pet adoption um App you were designing. Let's say, for example, instead of um, ask, instead of asking four people um, of their opinions and other, maybe you started to ask two, and then yeah. in the after designing and all that, did it like did it somehow affect your work in the end if you don't go so in depth with your research? Because I thought that most of your work had a lot to do with research. Yeah. Um. So there's a there's a there's an answer to that question. Hmm. Sorry. Is uh, getting some feedback. There's an answer to that question that I can give you the real answer, I can give you the fake answer. I'm gonna give you both because um, I think both are valid. So ideally, when you're making a persona, it's rooted in research that is a bit more thorough, right? Even the fact that I used about five people for the pet adoption one, right? Um, I would say like, if I had more time, I'll probably do more more research and use more people to define the problem. But you know, given the time constraints and given the time constraints that I put on myself, then I was able to like go ahead and still make some form of a persona there. But I usually give people the um, feedback where I tell them, I say, hey, this persona is not at all meant to be completely representative of the end user, but it is a way to show people like, hey, I use five people to kind of generate this. So if you're upfront with people who say, this is how I came up with it, it should be okay, right? But the idea is I wouldn't recommend to do a persona off of two people. I know time is, is um, a thing, right? Uh, but there's no reason why you can't do it for three people at the minimum, right? Like I wouldn't recommend saying, it's like saying like, oh, I'm able to understand, you know, how Ghana is like by talking to two Ghanaians. You know, like it's not, that's just not, not suitable. Right. Um, obviously, there's no I, there's an ideal number. Some people say seven. Sometimes some people say eight. Some people say twenty. Right. Everyone has their number. But I would say the idea is to get enough different opinions and enough different people to then see where you can be able to pattern match there. So I wouldn't say two is enough. If anything, I think their minimum is three or four. But um, to your point, if there is time constraints, obviously work with the best that you can. So why I say that is when you take the Netflix side of things, right? So forget Google, take the Netflix side of things that I was working with. That one, I didn't actually interview anybody for it, right? If you notice, I, I kind of, what I really did was I took our demographics and this was, granted, this is in a situation where I had researchers and they, they had information of just across all the years of research that they've done for Netflix on who the end user is. So I kind of took that information to go ahead and create these personas. Um, in that scenario, obviously, I had researchers that I could leverage some of their their um, expertise there to determine it. But even then, I didn't really design with people. For personal projects, when I'm doing personal projects, and I'm in a space where I'm time constrained, one from a financial perspective, but just generally, how much time will I assign to this? Sometimes you don't need to be as thorough, right? But the idea is to still talk to enough key stakeholders 
where you have people of varying degrees. So if I go back to those three people that I mentioned, right, you may have someone who has limited experience with your problem, someone who has who is either going through the problem that you're that you're trying to address, and maybe someone who has completed the problem. At the bare minimum, you can get them. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Are there any other questions? Cassie. Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, I didn't hear. You. Okay. I was like, you guys are clapping for me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. I didn't realize. <laughs> awesome. Um. Say that one more time. Sorry. No, I can't. <laughs> I still can't hear you. It's very muffled. I can hear you. Okay, so we don't have any more questions at the moment. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. And in general, um, if you have any other questions whatsoever, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not the fastest uh, at text, but I do get back to people usually within a couple of days. So if you have any questions, feel free. Um, and congratulations on your journey. I'm sure you all will be great. It's amazing to see what's being built with Speedturn and everything like that. So I'm excited to see the future of, of design here. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go to sleep now. All right, then. So I'll be yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.